Good afternoon or good morning, everybody, and welcome to another FinTech Nexus webinar. We've got a fascinating conversation on tap today. We have a panel of experts that are going to be talking all about data, particularly about max maximizing the value of your customers. So we're going to be really digging in, got a lot of practical examples to share. We have um, going, we're going to be covering a lot of ground. So Let's kick it off um, with some introductions here. My name is Peter Renton. I am the chairman and co-founder of FinTech Nexus. My pleasure to welcome you all here today. Um, with this, this webinar is, is brought to you by Pro Provenir. So why don't, why don't, Kathy, why don't you introduce yourself first? Great. So Kathy Stairs uh, with Provenir. So I'm the executive vice president of Americas and absolutely thrilled to be here. Um, a little bit about what Provenir does. We are an AI power decisioning platform. Um, and what that means is we allow our customers to make data-driven, intelligent decisions for their consumers across the customer journey at every digital footprint. And I'm looking forward to getting into the discussion today. Likewise. Okay, Al? Hi, Albert Perriou. I'm the CEO of Zilch's US business. Uh, Zilch is a direct-to-consumer credit provider and advertising technology platform. We span two geographies, the US and the UK, and our vision is to ultimately eliminate the cost of uh, consumer credit. So we have a virtual MasterCard accepted wherever MasterCard is, uh, and Zilch customers can either earn cash back rewards on debit payments with our PayNow product, or spread interest-free repayments over six weeks with our Pay Over Six Weeks product. Okay, Bridget? Good afternoon. My name is Bridget Hussein. I am the Vice President of Consumer Lending at the United Nations Federal Credit Union, commonly referred to as UNFCU, our acronym. We are honored to serve the financial needs of the United Nations community, serving over 200,000 members around the world. Okay, Chris. Chris Martin. Um, I'm our VP of Product Management and Link the Digital Transformation Efforts at Regional Finance. Uh, have a history in the fintech sector, starting with Capital One and uh, rolling into a few different startups and consulting stints. Regional is a $1.5 billion consumer lender um, and growing, and we'll share more about the business, I'm sure, as we get into the call. Thanks for having me. Okay. Thank you, everybody. So uh, before we get into the meat of the discussion, I do want to kind of just Share with the listeners a little bit more about your company, particularly the types of loans that you're doing, um, and maybe a little bit about your borrowers. So, Bridget, I know you've got a you've got a sort of a fairly unique borrower base, but why don't you tell us a little bit a little about them and about the types of loans? Correct. Um, so we are the financial institution for the United Nations employee. Uh, that being said, the, uh, most of our members and the people that borrow from us are not US persons. They are neither US citizens or, or US residents. Um, so the data conversation is a very interesting conversation for us to have because we're unable to leverage some of the credit attributes that would be commonly utilized by many US lenders. In terms of a product line, we offer credit cards, lines of credits, personal loans, home improvement loans, education loans, auto loans. We also do a large amount of business and international home loans. And we offer mortgages in Kenya and Uganda that are done through my team, the consumer lending team. We also have a large U.S. mortgage operation, but that's a separate area than my team. Okay, interesting. You, we'll have to dig into um, Uganda underwriting a, a little bit. But <laughs> anyway, um, Chris, what are, what? Just tell us about the the borrowers and the loans you do. Sure, uh, we're a consumer finance business, uh, customer facing. We've got branches in uh, 20 states, uh, expanding nationally. Uh, mostly secured and unsecured personal loans, um, higher risk consumers. Uh, and what we're really looking to do with those customers is uh, help them improve their credit and restructure their debt uh, as as they you know, proceed in the relationship with us. So how are you securing the loans for the secured loans? Uh, so we have some uh, that are secured through auto uh, refinance. Typically, um, there's other personal property loans that we do uh, in different states. Okay. Okay. Al? So Zilch offers interest-free credit uh, with a traditional buy now, pay later structure with some people may be familiar with. So it's an installment loan. It allows the consumer to defer their payments over four, four installments the first installment is due at sale. 
uh, and then the remaining installments are, 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 are spread over the next six weeks. No interest rate, uh, no late fees. Uh, typically, uh, what you'll find is upfront, we require a 25 or 50 percent down payment depending on the risk profile. Uh, customers are typical consumers, so they're looking for flexible payment options when they're making purchases. I think what's a little bit different about Zilch is because it's not a point of sale product, it's a card that you can essentially use anywhere MasterCard's accepted, it means we tend to see a lot of different types of purchases. Uh, everything from discretionary and non-discretionary items, small or large, and our, our, our demographic actually spans uh, from someone in their 20s all the way up to someone in their 70s. Right, got it. Okay. Okay, so Kathy, I want to turn to you and um, just talk about um, Proven Air for a little bit about the types of lenders that you're working with today. Sure. I mean, um, Proven Air works with all lenders, including some of the the um, topics or the types of lenders that um, Bridget, Chris, and Al have just gone through. So we work with fintechs, a lot of fintechs. Um, at different stages and ranges of, of fintechs from startups through to, you know, decacorns um, in the fintech space. We also work with traditional lenders. Um, you know, uh, we also work in the auto space with captives and other underwriters. Um, we work in the BNPL space. We work with specific customers that may be just subprime lenders or prime lenders, depending on um, the niche of what the fintech is serving, student loans, student loan underwriting. So we we cover the gamut, basically any organization in the financial services space, if you can think of that needs to underwrite a decision, um, we likely have a footprint in that place. We are a, a global, we're talking very specifically about the US today, but we are a global company um, with significant offices around the world. So we do have some niche fintechs um, in other places, financial inclusion is also a big space. So working with those organizations that specifically cater to um, financial inclusion is an example. Um, so a wide variety of customers in different spaces that we serve. Right. Okay. Okay. So let's dig into it right away here. And by the way, if you have a question for our panel, uh, hit the Q&A button at any time. We will uh, try and get to those later. So... Well, I want to talk, I want to dig into underwriting and specifically data used for underwriting. What what are the keys um, to using data for more accurate risk decisions? So I'm going to start with you, Chris. Why don't you uh, give us your thoughts? Yeah, so th there's a lot in that question. Um, yeah. Obviously, you've got, you know, good data and, and a variety of data sources. You've got the logic, but around that, you need to think about the, the processes that you're building, the people that um, are helping you make those decisions. Strong talent is critical, constant innovation, ability to iterate rapidly. Uh, I think the best lenders that I've seen in the space um, are, are test and learn lenders where they're not will, they're not um, afraid to try different things. And uh, in a lot of cases, you have to evaluate a lot of different data sources to really figure out which are the most valuable in that situation. So, yeah, that's that's what I've seen. Okay, okay. So, Bridget, um, I'm particularly thinking about um, you know, your perspective uh, as a credit union. What are what are some of the the data challenges, and how how are you kind of using data in your underwriting? Yeah, correct. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of our borrowers are not um, people with a traditional U.S. credit report. So we have leveraged a partnership to get credit data for 15 countries outside of the United States. So we have that in our back pocket. But I'd say a lot of it was that we had to learn to use our own data. Uh, so we had to build a custom scoring model in the absence of having a traditional FICO credit score. And then also what we learned over time is that a lot of our borrowers borrow from us again and again. So what we did was build in a data library behind our loan origination system, and that's pulling in the payment performance of their current loans or previous loans that have since been paid off. So we're looking at that string of data, almost that you would typically see on a credit report, that kind of 24 months of data, just to see it has their payments performed well. And if we can see these people have borrowed from us before they've paid well, then we can use that as well 
to provide those instant decisions to them. We're understanding that, you know, our members may be unique and that they, we don't have as much data available to them as a typical U.S. consumer, but their expectations are the same. Everybody is really looking for a fast and frictionless experience when they apply for a loan. So we're using, leveraging our own data in order to provide that experience to them. So what about for those, for those customers that haven't taken a loan yet i mean you do you have you'll have some data on them because they're a, they're a member but how how are you leveraging that for people who haven't taken a loan before correct so um because the united nations is our sponsor we also have a, a large amount of data into like the employment prospects of, of a borrower even somebody that hasn't borrowed from us previously so we just take in their employment information into consideration and we leverage that custom scoring model to provide them with a decision Okay. Okay. So Al, uh, I want to turn to you and get your perspective here on particularly from, uh, you know, you've, you've got a, you've got a different challenge in, in some ways in BMPL because you've got to be, you've got to be instant. You can't say, um, I'll give me, give me a week and I'll get back to you um, as someone sitting at the point of sale. Um, yeah. So what, what are the keys? What are, what are the keys for sort of the data sources and how you're using data to be able to create um, this instant approval? Look, uh, yeah, I think uh, she said it well regarding the United Nations and that process where as we have more transaction data, there's some good news with our product. It's 42 days, so it's turning over constantly. So the ability for us to say we should give you less credit, access to credit or additional access to credit based on your performance behavior is, is huge. But you probably can't uh, uh, understate uh, the value of, of open banking. So the idea of like looking into the bank account, a lot of it for us is making sure the customer had comfort around our security and understanding what happens if you share access that gives us more comfort into affordability and income. Without question, if, if you have access to that data, it gives us a lot more comfort on what exactly can we give you at this point in time and ultimately start to build a relationship with you. Uh, so the, it really comes down to the, the more... Uh, you know, obviously credit score traditional data is important, but the more you can get access to things that dictate the, their affordability and ultimately their income stream, it gives us a lot more comfort. And, and we can do that very quickly at, at that point of sale. And that will differentiate as well between what is the, ultimately the down payment we need you to, to provide. Uh, so if we, if we feel that there's a bit of a higher credit risk, but we've assessed it and gotten comfort on if you provide a 50% down payment, that really does eliminate a lot of the losses. That you typically would find either with zero down payment or 25% down, it cuts it in half. Um, so we, we look to blend that data to get that 360 degree view. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So, so Kathy, you work with a, a lot of lenders. You just described the variety a few minutes ago. Um, what are some of the things that you're seeing uh, best practices in, uh, in, in underwriting and the different types of data that lenders are using? So first of all, I think it's been highlighted very well, the bringing in as much data as you can to understand the customer journey is key. Um, so as many data sources, and we've, you know, we've all heard the term alternate data or alternative data combined with new data sources like open banking data, um, you know, through the entire customer journey is very important. And the ability, um, what I'm seeing is to inject that data at various touch points um, across the customer lifecycle, um, very important in originations, very important in fraud, um, right across the, the customer journey. The other thing that we're seeing as a huge best practice right now is leveraging AI machine learning um, in your decisioning and underwriting strategies. And what that enables you to do is machine learning can crunch a lot of data you know, at a very high speed and in, in ways that traditionally we couldn't do. And, and as people, you can't you know, synthesize that much data. And that allows you to do a couple things. One is it allows you to incorporate many variables that otherwise were undiscoverable, potentially in getting to know your customers. So you can use other attributes and variables to help either inform your scorecards, your models, your um, just overall fraud um, mitigation, all of those things and help identify ways that can ascertain the risk threshold as an example. And this is very important, as I mentioned, in financial inclusion. So utilizing that at very different um, touch points is important. That also, the third thing, allows you to have real-time treatment. So in the past, traditionally, 
um, for different customer treatments, we've had to rely on what is commonly used in the, in the um, industry as batch data and injecting data at that point and then doing um, sort of, Al touched on this, a backward look versus a point in time to understand if you're, you know, looking at additional products you're underwriting or what additionally you can cross sell, upsell to a customer allows you to have real time treatment. So you can take all of that data and make a decision at point in time, regardless of what digital touch point they in, are in across their customer journey. So those are a couple points to summarize. AI ML is something that is really starting to and, and has influenced um, the credit underwriting process. Yeah, for sure. And so let, let's maybe dig into that um, right now because we, you know, we've seen, I mean, AI is in, has been around for, for a long, long time. I know I remember talking to some of the folks at FICO, they were doing it in the 70s and 80s. Um, so I'm curious about um, maybe Chris. I know you, you you touched on this when we when we all chatted um, before this before we started here. So, what um, what are the ways that you're using it, um, and how is then is it is this sort of the the whole kind of hype of AI that's happened um, throughout the culture in the last uh, you know, six to nine months? Is that is there anything relevant there for lenders? Yeah, that, that's a good question, and honestly, one Peter that I'm still trying to wrap my mind around. Um, there's been a huge amount of hype around uh, tools like ChatGPT and AI broadly. Uh, obviously, as you mentioned, the lending business has been exploring and using machine learning tools for uh, really decades now, um, with Capital One being one of the pioneers in that mm -hmm. space back in the early '90s. Um, so, what what really is new? Um, I think obviously that there's a lot more uh, just proprietary algorithms that are in, in, insanely powerful out there. Uh, and so it's probably lowering the barriers to be able to, to do some of the modeling. Um, I'm also seeing some of the uh, uh, vendors out there connect those, um, you know, chat GPT and, and other AI models to proprietary data sources. So I think you, you'll be able to see those tools sort of tailor an interaction based on your, your company's data. And I think that could be really interesting, um, you know, probably push the shift towards, you know, more self-service, more AI-assisted interactions that, that will continue. I think as it relates to specifically sort of underwriting and decisioning, I haven't yet honestly seen any major impact. It's, it's more of a... Uh, at least from what I can tell, sort of a continued evolution on tools that sort of have already existed. It's it's more in these other places that I think there's maybe a, a bit more of a step change. So then, so then, how how are you using it today in your lending operation? So we have a, a very good data science team that is using um, you know sophisticated machine learning techniques um, to look at. A, a wide array of data. So I think uh, we, we use close to a thousand different data sources or data elements in our risk models to, to see what sort of pops. Um, trying to get uh, internal data sources together as well. I think you know there, there tends to be disparate silos, of customer data, customer interaction data. So sometimes it's hard to really deploy that in the underwriting experience the way you would like and, and trying to you know create consistent variables. Uh, in order to get those into a model and then have those be reviewed by your legal teams, your compliance teams, et cetera, can be tricky. Um, so, I, you know, honestly, I think it's just really talented people using the latest tools that are available to them, and having the greatest exposure to, you know, the different internal and external data sources that, that you, you you could hope to have. Um, right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Al, um, what what what's how is Zilch using uh, AI models in uh, in the underwriting process? Sure, and, and I think as Chris mentioned, it, it's been an evolution for a long time. So it's not like AI just showed up, as you mentioned, Peter, right. as well. I think the way we think about it is you're just, the ability to structure faster, more data is really what it comes down to. So the technology is just kind of caught up. It's now enabling our data science team to just get cleaner data faster, which then we input into the model. So 
a lot of it could be said also the behavioral data. Like it used to be, we have to, on a, it would take time to really build it up and take a look. Now with 42 day loans across a spectrum of different kinds of folks across different geographies, we're just able to really put that into place much quicker. Um, so it, it's simply put, I think it's just moving our underwriting data sets to be more complete, faster, to incorporate that then into our decision. Right, right. Okay, interesting. So um, Bridget, is there, what about you guys? I mean, you, you're, you're working with, um, I imagine, very, very different types of data in uh, depending on the country that the that, that your borrowers are in. What do, do you have a, um, are you incorporating AI into that as well? Yes, yes. We have been, uh, I would say, on this path for the last couple of years is, is learning to leverage our data. We recently went on to a new loan origination system, so that really kind of powered the ability to look at a wide range of data points. And as Kathy said, something like machine learning AI, that's really allowing us to improve our accuracy by analyzing a wide range of data. That's, you know, almost impossible for a, a underwriter to do manually, especially within a short period of time that the consumer is expecting you to get back to them in. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's definitely expanded access to credit as well for borrowers. There's a lot of people in the United States with either no file or thin file. And that's certainly the use case that we have as well, is that we're operating with an audience that pretty much has no FICO score at all or credit report. So learning to leverage that data to enable expanded access to credit is really important to us, as, long, as well as improving the efficiency of the team to improve our members' experience overall. Okay, so I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about fraud. And I'm actually going to go back to you, Bridget. And you know, because you, you're a member organization, I imagine fraud is not as as rampant as probably some of the other others on this on this uh, webinar. But I'd love to kind of get a sense of you know, I'm sure it's not zero, right? So you don't have any. There there are fraud. There, there's fraud everywhere. Um, how are you dealing with it? Yeah, I wish it was zero. I think we are fortunate <laughs> <laughs> that, that we are a union. So our experience is probably more limited than, say, Chris or Al's experience working in their companies. However, we do experience fraudulent applications. We have over time sought to leverage our own data to identify the patterns and the trends of which fraudulent applications occur, and then trying to automate that. Like we put those lessons learned into the system to flag them as like review indicators or almost like a red flag for our loan origination system. And that essentially means that the application will get kicked out of like an instant decisioning and it will go to that annual person to under the loan. Uh, we don't wanna auto decline those, those loans. Um, member experience is important to us. So we don't really like the concept of auto declining people holistically, but also it's more than just the loan application at that point. Right. If we have somebody that's performing a fraudulent transaction it's not only that we don't want the loan but we are also the whole relationship is now in question so you know we use that data if we can confirm by a manual intervention this is fraud we turn that over to an internal security and investigations team that will really consider if we want to maintain any relationship with the person right okay okay so so chris what about uh inside your operation um what's the what are, what are some of the fraud challenges and how are you dealing with them Sure. So we've historically been a branch-based lender, and we're in the process of transitioning to more of a digital-first interaction interaction model. Um, so in a branch model, fraud hasn't been as much of an issue because you know there's obviously a hurdle there for customers to come in and have a face-to-face -face conversation. Um, so as we move more of those interactions to, to the digital space, we're super conscious of um, fraud, you know, first-party fraud third-party fraud, synthetic fraud. Um, and so we're, we're currently using a combination of data, you know, raw data um, and, and analytic sources. So um, doing, you know, fraud models using a variety of, of, of data elements. We've got some vendors that are really excellent at helping us do that. Um, and then, you know, also using our, our own internal tools uh, and figuring out the customers who we aren't, you know, quite as sure about, and then pushing those into um, in, into more kind of in-person or branch assistant channels. Um, the the other thing that we're doing is using more credential data sources, which uh, sort of fits under that open banking umbrella, where customers are actually sharing things like you know their their payroll data from 
um, through credentialed services like Argon or their banking data through credentialed services like Plaid or Vinicity. And by doing that, you know, you're, you're validating that that customer has a history, right? So if they're able to show pay stubs over a course of a year, that's going to give you a much higher degree of confidence that that customer is who they say they are. Um, so that combination so far has been pretty effective uh, for us, but we're you know, obviously keeping a really close eye on this. So right. Big rest of the yep. No, those, the, 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 getting those outside credentials, I think, really, really makes a difference. Um, Al, I mean, there's been a lot of lot written about BNPL and fraud um, over the last uh, you know year or two, but how how are you combating? And I imagine it's 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 um, a challenge, but love to love to kind of get the the low down there. It is a challenge, and I, I think what we've seen, and I'll try to talk about both. But you know, what you saw a lot was third party, and now it's shifting towards first party in right. many instances. So there, there, the, the, we have to combat it on, on both fronts. I think when it comes to Zilch, there's an important distinction a bit with some of our peers, which is we create the relationship directly with the consumer. We, we do not go through merchants directly uh, to source that customer, which means the end user is our customer. So that direct relationship with our customers helps us because they engage actively with the app or the website in our case. So we can see more in terms of their behavior. When are they checking the app? Where are they? What are they doing uh, to help us protect against fraud? But when you think about onboarding, you know, we have to validate every consumer identity. Obviously, we have a, a robust KYC process. It scores the applicants based on their strength and longevity of their digital footprint. So you're looking at obviously names, things, name, address, date of birth, email. Is that matching to a geolocation data? Uh, and when you think about IDV, you have to be very strict. So requirements there, we require a physical copy. We take a selfie to validate true ownership of the account. And you know, I think these are some of the things that Chris alluded to. And there's, there are vendors out there that are actually very strong that we leverage in partnership with our own proprietary data. And then if you think about the actual design of the, the product, you know, each transaction validates a debit card on file that's owned by the customer. And we're, we're rat matching in that critical personal information. I'm looking at to see if the cash balance required to make a down payment is there with associated with the transaction and are they in good standing with their issuing bank. So as we open up the open banking component and, and making sure they're, they're, they're sharing that information, again, that becomes more critical. We also leverage learnings from the MasterCard network so we can decline transactions to what we, what we could be potentially fraudulent merchants, especially if you've seen the elevated level of, of recent chargeback. And then another one on the, on the, on the third party side is we have a virtual card. So not having a physical card does help us because we enable it before each use. So uh, it, it's actually, if you steal someone's zilch card number, doesn't really do anything. It's essentially useless to a fraudster. They're unable to enable that card via the app before use. On the first party front, again, it comes back to how much information do I have in terms of transaction history, either with zilch or ultimately if they provide us access to the bank account, then we can see and understand what exactly is their transaction history, what is their affordability based on existing uh, transaction flow, and again, their income, and how is that coming in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Okay, so Kathy, like you've heard a lot of uh, some of the lenders discuss it here. I mean, you, you're, you're talking with, um, with many others in the industry. What are some of the best practices that you're seeing um, to combat fraud? I think that it's been highlighted here and I think it's, you know, potentially specific to the organization, but there are some things that cross regardless of where you are. And one is a robust as an example, KYC, um, you know, process, especially at the point of origination. And I think one of the things that's required to do that is to have the technology enabled to use multiple data sources. So we've talked about niche providers and there are some that are excellent in very specific things, but how do you take all of those things and put them together to enable a decision in real time? And we're all talking, you know, predominantly about real time or near real time decisions that need to be made. So it's almost like an orchestration of all of those different data sources that feed into, you know, a fraud model and, you know, incorporating again as a data source as any data you have on them from their own um, interactions with the organization. So I think that using multiple different streams of data, multiple different data providers, gathering as much data as, um, that's available to, to um, 
combat fraud, and that means you know using data sets that we might not traditionally use, obviously combined with traditional data sets that are out there in your own data. So I think best practices is using multiple data sources that reflect the need you have in your business. And then also looking at, you know, across the customer life cycle, how do you maintain that level of fraud mitigation without compromising um, the experience that your consumer is having? Experiential banking is, I think, very top of mind for the end consumer. And so, you know, personalized journeys uh, across the life cycle are also very important. So understanding your customers. So providing and customers demand a high level of fraud protection themselves, especially when they're providing data that is very personal to them, you know, banking data, identity data, you know, transaction history data, all of that is something that they have to trust the lender with when they're providing that. And so, you know, managing that let's mitigate fraud with all the data sources that we have without compromising experience is something that always needs to be married in an organization. So I think best practices is using as much data as you can in a very short time to make a decision on how you interact with that customer point of sale. You know, um, if they're coming on digitally to open an account, if they're coming on to access a different account, increase lines, there's all sorts of activities that they can do. And using all of those different data sets in real time um, through robust technology and robust data science to be able to fulfill that need for experiential banking that is a demand of the consumer. Right. right. Okay. Okay. So I want to dig into um, the increasing the value of this, this, this webinar is titled maximizing the value of your customers. So let's talk about that specifically now. Um, the lifetime value of your customers, we obviously all want, we don't want just a one-off sale. Um, everyone wants people to come back. Um, you know, what, maybe uh, Chris, I can start with you. What, what is some of the data that you're looking at to help cross-sell your borrowers? Or um, when when we underwrite our customers and re-underwrite them, as I mentioned earlier, one of our strategies is really to help um, you know customers who may be underserved uh, and give them access to credit in a way that allows them to um, expand that access and potentially consolidate higher interest rates. So, so to be honest, uh, it, it, this has been less historically about us gathering a bunch of great data sources and more about just creating great customer relationships, uh, which has traditionally been more of a human interaction. Um, and so we're working to try to bring that sort of really strong um, level of trust that, that we're able to build through our associate interactions into the digital environment. Um, and we're pulling, you know, uh, some interesting tools to, to help with that. And I think a, a big one is understanding, helping customers understand their options. And uh, that's, I think, both a data problem as well as a product design problem. There's, uh, you know, quite a bit of complexity in financial products. And when you look at, you know, a core, uh, core loan and uh, other ancillary products that can lay on top of that, um, that are oftentimes really helpful for the customer. Um, that's a lot of information to convey. So the, the combination of how you do that um, in a way that allows them to understand it and what are they uh, what are they qualified for. So you know that's probably the reason I'm in. <laughs> I, I wake up every day. You know, right. all of that information, all of those options. How do you bring that all together in a compelling way for the customer uh, so that it really creates uh, an experience that they enjoy, which I think you know, we're still as an industry, not, not quite there yet, um, is, is something that we're, we're working through. So, uh, yeah, I don't think there's any silver bullet there. It's just, you know, keep, continue to iterate, find what's, what's working, um, it, you know, test and learn. And keep right, going. right, right. So, so Bridget, I'm curious about um, you guys, because you mentioned, you mentioned many different loan verticals that you operate in today. Um, so you've got a lot of opportunity for cross-sell. What are some of the keys for your cross-selling program? Yeah, well, we do. So on a quarterly basis, and we combine information from our core banking system with our loan origination system data and our marketing database. 
uh, really trying to understand what kind of customer segment the member is in, as well as that, like what's their lending eligibility based on the last income that they provided to us, their last GTI that, that we have on file. We're looking at kind of standard credit score information as well as our own payment experience and some employment information to be able to cross sell additional lending and even deposit products to them to meet their needs. Um, and the really nice feature that we've been working on is now we wanna to go to them with a, a firm offer, a pre-approval, so that when they log into digital banking, they see this offer there. It's a really nice experience for the borrower. I think it takes out a lot of anxiety in the process of, okay, I don't know if I'm gonna put in this effort to apply and it might get turned down. A pre-approval is a great experience for a member to say, okay, yes, I'm, I'm here, I see it, I'm, I'm gonna click fill in three fields and my application is approved. Yeah, interesting. Um, Al, let's face it, BNPL is all about the repeat sale, right? You you don't want to have you don't want to have a customer come along and just do one sale and then go away forever. What in how are you how are you increasing engagement with uh, with your customers? Good question. And like I guess taking it from the top Again, we're direct to consumer, so a bit of a different animal than having to deal directly with point of sale. So again, we are able to market to our customers directly, reach out, see them more engaged in the app uh, than, than others. And we're not tied to any agreements with merchants where there's pressure to, to, to perform a certain way. Um, so as a result of not focusing directly on the merchant, but more specifically, how do we get you to use this product more as a day-to-day -day thing, whether it's lowering the minimum amount of a purchase? Uh, which is essentially almost zero on our app. Uh, tap and pay was something that our users really wanted. Um, so what we've seen in some of our more mature customer cohorts now is you see a lot of folks using Zilch to pay for the coffee uh, or pay for the commute to work or, or lunch. But it's not really just these large discretionary purchases like electronics or an expensive uh, piece of clothing. It's really how do you get users to use this for those daily purchases. So a lot of our marketing is directed that way. A lot of our app flow is directed that way. You know, our goal is not to tempt customers into spending more than they can afford. That's where the affordability analysis comes in. But it's how do you get to be more top of wallet payment um, right. given that we don't charge interest and we don't charge late fees. So a lot of our focus is on our, on our journey and also in our marketing is ultimately, hey, you don't have to put this on a card, a, a, a credit card. If you're buying a, a, a lunch, you could actually pay that in installments that are interest-free uh, without late fees. Right, right. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so so Kathy, I want to turn to you and I want to add a little element here. Like people are talking about ways to, um, to grow their loan book, but let's talk about um, risk as well. So what, what, how are lenders growing their loan book today while at the same time? you know, trying to lessen, reduce their risk? So I think that, that um, you know, the panel has touched on a couple things. So one is is looking at the data that you have internally um, to understand the behavior of your customers. So it's know your customer across the life cycle, not just at the point of origination or acquisition. And again, it comes down to how do you use the data? And so internal data is very important because you understand how the customers interacted with you in the past and you can pull that into decisioning. You still, I think, need to be looking at other sources of data. We've touched on it, open banking data or transaction bank account data that is always pulled into to look at um, how you're interacting with your customer, what models you're building to interact with your customer, behavioral models, that sort of thing, so that when you do present, as an example, we've talked about cross-sell or upsell um, a customer. One way is pre-approval to look at that, as Bridget outlined. The other is to look at next best offer. So how do you use the data you have to provide the next best offer? So a customer um, may come in and apply for you know, a credit card and request a balance of you know, $5,000. And you can, instead of declining that customer, either again at the point of origination or an existing customer, present back to them based on the data you have. You can have a you know, credit card with a balance of $3,000. You know, we have an alternate product that may serve your needs um, and you are already approved. Click here, put in, you know, the bridge said three different data elements and that gets fulfilled in real time. So I think maximizing it is continuing to use the data 
um, that you have both external data and internal data to continually understand how your customer interacts with you. And again, pulling in that experiential um, demand of consumers, personalizing that through these types of offers to customers um, and mitigating the risk is again, using that fraud aspect that we've talked about across every digital in, um, interaction that you have with the customer. So marrying the data that you have on them, marrying you know the models and the data science that you've used that are all have data elements that are injected into them in order to maximize the value with without compromising experience or risk. And I think that that's very important when we talk about making sure we can maximize a customer um, value. I think we need to balance that with the experience of the customer because if you if the experience isn't there in a way that consumers drive, then you can't maximize the customer um, in general. So you know we talked on as an example on machine learning, and yes, that's been around and the concept's been around. Um, but having the ability to, as an example, use alternate data um, variables that are in there to use machine learning in real time to, to spin up additional models that may be able to be used in a customer journey that may provide you the ability to maximize that customer within your own portfolio. And then using champion challengers, that was, we talked, I think, Chris, it was you that raised up the ability to test different things in market um, with a certain percentage of customers or running it on, on your internal and, and synthetic data sets to see if there's a way that you can interact with your customer to drive more value, which in turn drives you know stickiness and more um, appetite for them to choose different products with you. As Al said, being top of wallet um, so that they go to you with your needs versus you know someone else who's marketing to them. Right, right. That, that. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, and by the way, just a reminder to the audience, if you have a question, hit the Q&A button. We, we can get to those shortly. Um, it's made, got me thinking as you were talking there, Kathy, that, you know, Chris, I, I want to turn to you because you've, you, you're doing, you, you're going through this transition. You've, you, you've been a, uh, you know, a physical um, lender, like the you know, face to face, uh, where you're doing where you're doing loan applications, um, where you can get identity documents and you can look people in the eye and all that sort of thing. And now moving into the digital realm, what what are some of the key learnings that? How are you trying to kind of duplicate some of what you've had in the you know in the in person into the digital realm? And how are you kind of balancing sort of the the needs? Some of the things that Kathy was just pointing out there about the you know the user experience and the personal journeys that uh, personalized journeys that, that, that you want people to go down. How are you bringing that into digital? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's the other reason I wake up. Um, <laughs> so it, that's a, it, it's a fascinating question, right? So everybody is designing digital interactions to be seamless and straightforward and clean and easy and, you know, low effort, that sort of thing. Um, but when you're trying to, build a relationship with somebody, is that really the interaction? Is that the only interaction? Um, and so, you know, we're, we're trying to think about what an experience looks like, an origination experience is that, that combines um, low friction, you know, seamless, clean digital interactions with um, human assisted interactions that really uh, target high value points in a conversation. Um, and so, you know, think, think about kind of c complex product sales or um, debt consolidation opportunities, things like that for us where, you know, the, the customer may not immediately know they have this card um, sitting on, you know, th that's, that's costing them, you know, 30 some percent that they would be able to re refinance at, at a lower amount or, um, you know, this auto loan has, has a different term and be able to mix. So, so those types of conversations. Um, you want to have all the data to get to them, right? So a lot of that's in the Bureau, um, but there are other sources as well, including internal data. Uh, but then how do you combine that to really help your customer understand the options as well as your team understand what they should be kind of focused on in that conversation with the, with the customer? So, um, you know, we're a customer of Proven Air and, and have been looking at using that software to, to make sure that we're making some of these decisions. We have other 
um, AI platforms that Reason help make some of those decisions and continue to expand on that. Um, but uh, I, I think it's a combination of you know the intelligence and the data uh, timed at the right spot with the right product design to help really kind of synthesize the complexity into something your customers and associates can understand and bring all that together. So uh, no, yeah, no perfect answer there, but right. I, I, that's that's a place that we're continuing. Right. And what, what, what about, um, like, so Bridget, for you guys, I mean, if you're, you're dealing with people all over the world, I imagine you've, you don't have locations all over the world, do you? I mean, you, you, you're, you're going to be dealing with these people digitally anyway. Um, is that like, what, what sort of, what kind of experience are you, are you trying to give them? Correct. In that aspect, we would be very different from a typical credit union that's kind of like brick and mortar uh, yeah. um, for as you know, multiple branches. We have a very, very small branch um, network. And overseas, we have what we call representative offices. They're very similar to what we would consider a branch, just they don't have a teller service line available. It's just really customer service representatives that are available in those locations. But because we cannot be in over 190 countries around the world, that's just economically impossible for us to do so. Right. The, the creation of a fully digital experience is really what we need to provide for our members and for our borrowers. So for us, that's seamlessly integrating multiple vendor partnerships into our pages and onto our branding. So all of the activity that's really required to apply for a loan and to service that loan can really be completed within digital banking. Mm -hmm. And and we also don't want our members to have to call us. It's expensive to make a very right. to make an international call. So we really are leading with like a digital first experience, so that members can reach out to us at any time or any place in the world. Interesting. Okay, okay. So we have a question coming in here. Um, in the customer management side, what kind of early warning triggers data are you looking at, which might require credit restructuring to address financial distress? Who wants to take that one on? I can comment uh, a few ways of what we're seeing um, yeah. across the customer base. And one of them is using, you know, we've talked a little bit about open banking, transaction banking, cash flow banking, um, and having the ability to look at all of that coupled with your own data on how they're performing, say, in the product historically, or making sure products are linked. So if they have a credit card and a loan you know, what, what is the total debt ratio service ratio that's happening there. And I think it's, it's being very proactive in looking at those early distress and then having a reach out to the customer um, when you see that. So those are the types of data sets we're having. And I think it's important that we shift waiting for them to be in a distressed environment to being able to be very proactive, educational, you know, bringing on how you refinance, providing alternate products and to the customer to help them get before they get into a situation where, you know, we're in a collections charge off all of those sorts of activities and help provide the education and plan on how to get them back on track. So really flipping that to a much more positive experience versus traditionally maybe a negative experience. So you know, specific types of data sets, I can't comment on how each customer uses their own data to be able to do that. But there are um, triggers, you know, a lot of different companies provide trigger um, data points that can come in and let you know, based on multiple trade lines, based on multiple products that they're running into a cash flow situation. Um, and those could be some early um, warnings that, that you can trigger internally to allow you to do an outreach. They're also driving, um, just to add on to that, I know it wasn't a part of the question, but these types of things are also driving innovation and driving um, organizations to be able to both service and provide additional products potentially to customers that may be running into that situation on how, you know, not just a traditional refinance, um, but looking at other products such as a BNPL product versus a credit product. Um, that other institutions are starting to offer in those types of financial instruments. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But some other thoughts on that, Peter, um, sure. where, where I would look and we're doing more of this the origination step than necessarily the customer management step, but some of the um, open banking tools that uh, are customer credentialed that give you access into bank transactions um, 
being able to understand, you know, wh where a uh, bank account maybe, you know, has an average balance of X and that's gone down, or, or you're seeing a lot of, um, you know, uh, payments that that are coming back, NSFs, things like that. That would be one place to look. I think a lot of cases, if you're if you're waiting on the bureaus to get that information, it's probably not going to be as helpful. Yeah. Um, given given the delay, um, so hopefully, as you know, we continue to innovate around the space, we've got a, a more real time data source that an alternative to the bureaus. We'll have more of these signals that will help us be proactive. Okay, so another question coming in here about fair lending. There has been lots of regulator uh, talk regarding fair lending as AI underwriting or machine learning evolves. How um, do institutions continue to remain compliant and ultimately avoid any potential or clear fair lending issue? Who wants to tackle that one? Well, I guess I'll start, but I think we're very sensitive to the fact that we're, we're issuing consumer credit. Right. Um, so, uh, from a regulatory perspective, we're, we're conscious of our, the processes that our issuing bank works with. We actually have several state licenses ourselves in the UK. We voluntarily, uh, applied for an FCA license, even though we didn't require one. So uh, look, it, it comes to the culture more than anything else and the training and making sure that you're very hypersensitive to every employee understanding from a marketing perspective to an underwriting perspective that you're not hitting any, uh, any issues. So I, I think it just comes down to as simple as that, like making sure you have the right policies in place, the right infrastructure in place, uh, and being sensitive to not just at the federal level, but the state level. Yeah, I, I would agree with Al 100%. I think, you know, AI and machine learning are, are very useful tools. On the flip side of that, their algorithms can become very complex and they can become really difficult to interpret. So as a lender, you better make sure that you have a staff member that's able to explain why a decision was made, not only to a borrower, but to our regulators as well. Um, to, we have a requirement to provide a clear explanation for the credit scoring models that we use and why we would choose to approve or decline a loan application. And I think on top of that, one of the major things that regulators look out for is that bias, that there is no discrimination in your automated or artificial intelligence or any machine learning models that you use. So my recommendation would be to test it and make sure that it's tested by not one person, but several people to make sure that the bias is non-existent. Right. And I mean, there's a lot of work being done. Um, I think today with, uh, you know, I, 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 there's, there's lots of different ways that you can do that. And I think there are companies now that are just specializing in helping helping trying to detect bias and overcome bias in, in, in AI lending programs. Just one, one thing to add yep. there that may, may be helpful, um, looking at the input variables that you're using, that you're basing those models on and making sure that, you know, ageism doesn't creep into their location, doesn't creep into their so spending a, a super close eye on the data that, you know, serves as the foundation for the decision. Right, right. Okay, so I wanna I wanna talk just briefly about embedded finance because in, in, embedded lending, shall we say, or in, in, you know, embedded finance in general is um, really opening up new doors. I mean, you could argue that BNPL in its entirety is an embedded finance product. Um, what what are um, some of the ways that you guys are, are taking advantage of embedded finance? The, uh, well, I'll, I'll start, but it's it, for, for us, again, we're a bit of a different animal because we're direct to consumer. But what we found is as we've aggregated a, a loyal user base, merchants have been approaching us to, uh, to try and set up programs. So for us, it's, it's tr figuring out um, marketing is actually great. So awareness is half the battle, right? Um, so making sure that we have additional marketing spend that necessarily we don't have to consume completely, but it helps us with our CAC, number one. Two, credibility. So if you're associated with certain merchants and brands that they're using on a regular basis, that absolutely plays a role as well. Um, so we're taking advantage of it from our perspective. We spun it a little bit differently, which is we have the user base. So some merchants are coming to us. But we're also leveraging it now and saying, hey, we, we've built a base. Uh, how do we work together on the marketing awareness front? Um, we've also found that uh, if they're using one type of product, they're typically purchasing a different product that's a related topic. So can we also leverage that in terms of uh, finding those merchants as well? Okay. 
So let's maybe, um, I, I'd, I'd like to close, unless there's any more questions, um, I would like to close with sort of a more of a, you know, kind of looking towards the future. And, you know, we've, 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 we've talked a lot today um, about, you know, different data sources, different ways to analyze data and, you know, the, just the explosion in AI and the technology there. But as we look sort of more to, to the future, where, when, when, particularly when it comes to, to lending operations, where, where, do, what improvements still need to be made? What would you like, what's, what would be on your wish list that we don't have today that, um, technology maybe can be developed uh, down the, in the future. So just thought I'd throw it out there as a, as some, some with some closing comments. So I'll maybe start on that one. Um, I would like to see if it's, it's on the wish list. I, think. I, I would like to see more of a customer back company begin to structure itself as a consumer advocate and having kind of access to that customer's data in a way that is more customer controlled. Um, and customer friendly. So, you know, we've grown up around Bureau data being the, the primary source of underwriting and the business model for the Bureau is, is very much a lender back business model and as is most of these data companies. And if you've ever tried to in, interact with the Bureau to, you know, correct any of your data, you, you know that that is not necessarily the most customer friendly of, uh, of institutions. And so we have an opportunity with you know, all of the digital tools that are out there now and the ability for customer to have much, much more of a direct interaction with, uh, with a lot of these companies. Uh, I'd love to see somebody take advantage of that and, and really have, you know, the, the customer be the source of the business model, not necessarily kind of always that, that you know, be driven by the lender. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's well said. I, I was thinking, you know, we always speak about this, but I'm not sure anyone's executed well on it is, the idea of some additional consortium of data. A lot of our industry, it's not competition necessarily, it's, it's co-optition, like we all work together. The more data we would have on a consumer, the better. So if there was some extent where they would either opt in and they choose who or allow themselves to be part of this information, uh, it would be nice. Cause I think there's a lot of data we don't necessarily share between uh, lending partners, uh, which ultimately if we had all that data in one place, we're probably making even better decisions and more transparent decisions for our customers. Okay, well, with that, I think we'll leave it there. Thank you very much, um, uh, Kathy, Al, Chris, and Bridget. And thank you, of course, to uh, Provenir for, for sponsoring this session. It was a fascinating conversation. And of, of course, thank you to the audience for, for watching or listening. Um, have, have a great afternoon, everybody. Thanks a lot. Thanks, thank Peter. You. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Have a good one. Yep, bye.